This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com. As part of our ongoing series on financial repression, I have Nick Gianbrino to, uh, joining us here this morning. Nick is senior editor of the International Man.com uh, at Casey Research and is a member of the Casey Research team. Welcome, Nick. Oh, hi, Gordon. Thanks for having me. Nick, it's a pleasure to have you. And I, I'm really looking forward to our conversation because you have a very unique background and uh, some of the things that you can share with our listeners. Uh, Nick, maybe we could begin with you uh, telling our listeners your background, some of the things you're involved with. Yeah, sure. I'm the uh, senior editor at Doug Casey's International Man site. And that website is actually uh, based on Doug's first book of the same name that was written in the late 1970s. In short, it's, it's about uh, international diversification, helping people diversify different aspects of their life to obtain... Uh, more freedom from the their home government to dilute the power that the bureaucrats in their home government wield over them. So what? How do you do that? You do you take different components of your life and you put them in jurisdictions that make the most sense. So you want to have your banking in one jurisdiction. You want to have multiple passports. You want to have your business in one jurisdiction, and, and so forth. And when you do these things, uh, you can really open up a whole new world of opportunities for yourself, for your investments, uh, you know, for your employment opportunities. And you can also protect yourself from the, you know, the actions of an out-of-control government. Now, I, we had uh, uh, Doug on here just a while ago, and it was just a great interview. And I think Doug's been in, oh, I don't know, I think 140 plus countries over the course. He's lived in, I think, at least 10, and and which was fascinating with his perspective. It was a great interview. But you've also lived abroad, and so you have a pretty good international background. Uh, yeah, that's right. I've lived and worked in uh, the Middle East uh, mostly, in uh, in Beirut, in Lebanon, and also in Dubai, uh, where I worked uh, with an investment bank. And at that investment bank, I researched uh, Middle Eastern stocks and provided uh, research coverage for those uh, stocks. And I also have uh, lived and worked in, in Europe as well. So those two regions I'm uh, most intimately familiar with. I'm going to draw upon that perspective um, as also a carrier of an American passport, because we're going to talk about financial repression, uh, not just in America, but on a global basis. But, uh, Nick, could you define financial repression in, in your words, how, how you see it to be, or what sure. you see it to be? Yeah, sure. Well, when I first heard of financial repression, it was some, from some IMF documents. So I, I immediately thought, when I heard the word that this is a mistake, how, why would they use a word that conveys some sort of authoritarianism or some sort of negative uh, thing when they really, I think what they wanted to do was convey some sort of uh, vague academic term for what they were describing. But that's why I think it's ironic that they chose to use the word financial, financial repression because... If I can, if I can interrupt, uh, that w I read the same paper and I believe on page 68 it was initially referred to as a liquidation tax. That was immediately removed also. Yeah, well, there you know you have to cut through these euphemisms and the you know the news speak that these uh, these people use. But yes, financial repression, in my mind, I, I like to call it or think of it as financial authoritarianism because that better defines what it actually is. Because it's not just repressing financial aspects when you know, we know we're talking about having interest rates lower than the market rate for example to help a government finance its debt which sounds pretty academic to most people and it doesn't sound like you know oh, how does this affect me but when you look at the indirect and the uh, immeasurable effects that come out of this it is really something that represses not just financial things it represses all aspects of life and when you consider the pop, that, that kind of power that's wielded through financial repression, it's really, in my mind, more accurate to call it financial authoritarianism, because that's what it basically is. How broad-based is this outside of the United States right now, Nick? 
Well, I, I think it's I think it's part and parcel with uh, the the central the concept of central banking because if you look at financial repression, financial repression uh, is needed to help governments finance debt. So why do governments have debt? Because governments spend money and they need to finance that spending and they use it through debt. So that is that is where the impetus from for financial repression comes from. It's government uh, spending. And you know, since basically every country in the world has the uh, central banking model and the central and fiat currency, this 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 is what allows financial repression to exist because it gives the government the tools to manipulate uh, the currency, to manipulate the interest rate uh, that they otherwise wouldn't have under a you know honest money or sound money kind of system. So I think that is 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 the source of financial repression, and this and central banking is the linchpin of how. Uh, it, it's actually implemented. Are you seeing any recent developments that are more troubling than others in in uh, financial repression, either in the United States or abroad? Well, I think you know the biggest example of financial repression, just the most obvious, is 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 how interest rates are are manipulated uh, lower than the market rate. And if you think about that, um, it's really what it is. Okay, so you look at the difference between what the market rate of interest would be under free market conditions and what the interest rate is now under the manipulated conditions, essentially zero. That difference between those two interest rates is essentially uh, purchasing power that the government is taking from savers. And it, it, it's, it's like a hidden tax in that sense. They're taking something um, through you, through this manipulation of interest rates and central banking. But it just goes back to, you know, the concept you learned in kindergarten, you know, should you take something that is not yours? And this allows them to take something that is not theirs without the other person really knowing wh who or what is, is taking their purchasing power from them. But just because it's cloaked in academic terms and seemingly complex uh, financial uh, lingo doesn't doesn't change the underlying morality of what they're doing. They're taking something from somebody else without their permission or their consent and they're doing it in a sort of sur surreptitious, uh, surreptitious way. And uh, so that is that, I, I think the, the interest rates is the biggest example of financial repression and it's impossible to measure the effect of that. If you, you just have to think how how much malinvestment was created from having interest rates at artificially low levels? You know where businesses would loan take out loans to build factories that they don't need, uh, where they otherwise wouldn't under conditions where the interest rate would be higher. So it sends bizarre signals to the business community. It also helps government finance its spending. So it's you know for the U.S. government, it's able to you know spend more money on welfare and warfare. It, it, it's it's really hard to wrap your head around the total the, the you know the total net effect that financial repression has because it is so massive. The degree of malinvestment, the mispricing of risk, the lack of price discovery that comes with this is as you say you just can't begin to define it. But uh, the size of it. But but clearly, I think what's most troubling to me is not that it's happening, but it's happening. It's something that's happening in a devious manner. Um, the, the, it's clearly a process to, in fact, pay the government debt. And it's a transfer of wealth through purchasing power from the saver, from those who have the assets, to the government. And it's a tra and wealth being defined as purchasing power. And, and in fact, it's, hap and it's happening de in a devious manner is the most troubling because it's different the government say, we have a problem here, so we're going to fix it. In other words, you're on the outside, they're on the inside. Oh, precisely. And this is only possible because a central bank exists and a fiat money system exists. If they didn't have those tools, they couldn't steal wealth from people in a hidden fashion like that that they otherwise wouldn't understand. Whereas if people were taxed, honest, you know, they had an honest system and they had to be taxed to finance their spending, they would understand the effects of it. But They'd see it, they'd understand it, nobody's going to like it, yep. but at least it's a government for the people by the people and trying to uh, solve the problems. I'm not saying any of the people would vote for that and therein lies the rub and why it has to become uh, this manner. But there are two cornerstones financial, or a number of them, but to, for implementation. One is negative real interest rates, as you've laid out, which is the f form of, of shifting that wealth. But the other is to ring fence people's abilities to invest their money through reg various controls of regulations and laws that go with it. And the most blatant to me right now is FATCA. 
And I would wonder if you could share your views on, on fat or what it is and, and, and what's going on there. Yeah, and I think you hit the nail right on the head. Because if you're going to have financial repression, you have to control capital. If you don't control the capital, you can't repress it. So what FATCA is, FATCA is called as an acronym for the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. It's, the, it's one of these things that was shoved into one of these thousand page bills that nobody in Congress read and nobody really understood the ramifications of what they were passing. So it was stuffed into one of these bills, I think it was like four years ago in the Higher Act, um, four years ago. And you know, nobody reads these thousand page bills, so nobody thought anything of it. And then now what it does is, is it, a lot, it, it forces every financial institution in the world uh, to report to the IRS, to their, the IRS's satisfaction, uh, information about American clients and at the uh, foreign institution's expense, of course. Now, the reason that they compl the foreign institutions comply with this is because the U.S. dollar is still the world's reserve currency. And, you, you know, if you're an a bank and you want to do any sort of international business, you have to have access to the dollar. Now, how long that lasts, you know, I don't think it'll last forever, but it, 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 that's how it is now. So no bank is going to willfully kick themselves out of the U.S. dollar system. So that, has, that is a very, very big stick that the U.S. government wields, essentially, you know, being able to control the world's reserve currency and, by extension, the vast majority, majority of international trade. So they're able to force their terms on the rest of the world in ways that most other countries couldn't. So if you imagine if, like, Mexico had a version of FATCA, the Mexican government said, hey, everybody in the world has got to tell us about the Mexican citizens that are banking here, or we're going to cut you out of the peso-based financial system. Nobody would care. It's different with the U.S. dollar, so they, you, they are able to enforce their will on the world. And I think what in, exemplifies this uh, perfectly is, is how they were able to get Putin, Vladimir Putin, out of all people, signed on to FATCA in the summer of 2014, the summer of this year. And when that happened, fat, the battle for FATCA is over. It, 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 once Putin signed, China signed, and FATCA became you know, a fact on the ground, there is nobody, no country, meaningful country in the world that is going to stand up to FATCA. I mean, unless you want to bank in North Korea, Iran, or Cuba, you can pretty much count on the U.S. government uh, knowing about your finances. So the battle for FATCA is over. And what it does, what this, this is, getting back to your uh, question about uh, penning uh, capital in the United States, it doesn't make it illegal per se to take money outside of the United States. It just makes it very difficult. And it raises the cost of doing it for the financial institutions that would take Americans on as clients. Now, this has had a deterrent effect uh, in that most banks around the world, there are some exceptions, but most banks around the world, they want nothing to do with American clients because, one, the regulatory burdens are so high and expensive uh, that it just doesn't make business sense to take them on as clients. Two, there's a huge risk. Even for an honest mistake, a foreign financial institution has with dealing with an American client can bring enormous and draconian penalties upon them. So for those two reasons, the expensive uh, of compliance and the risk of making an honest mistake, most foreign financial institutions just make the logical decision, we don't want to have Americans as clients. So it has that effect too. It, it has the effect of making it more difficult for Americans to move capital abroad, and that narrows uh, your choices when you're, you're looking to internationalize. So that's part and parcel with uh, the whole financial repression that's going on here, because if a significant amount of Americans were able to get their savings out of the United States and into something that was, you know, the United States couldn't manipulate, then that would put a, a damper on their ability to, you know, repress interest rates, for example. I, I just can't imagine what the expats and the hundreds of thousands of them who are on foreign assignments with major corporations, it's a standard kind of practice with any large S&P company, they're trying to live with their families in countries where the banks really don't want them as clients. I know I lived for a number of years in Europe, in Paris, and Frankfurt, and I was always dealing with the bank because you were having to move money. You had, you know, still things going on in other countries, and it was just the operations of life. And if you don't have a strong relationship with that bank, uh, you it's almost impossible. Yeah, and this is it's it's really sad because it's destroying the lives of so many expats because that, it's, that's it, what I think is happening. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not it's this is not you know this is hurting middle class people. This is not hurting necessarily you know rich fat cats like they're in you know they claim it is. It's hurting middle class people who just have a savings account or a retirement account or a mortgage account abroad 
whose bank or financial institution has now kicked them to the curb because they don't want to comply with the onerous IRS regulations. And you can't really blame them. The blame, so what, in so my what opinion... They, what oh, do they do, Nick? What do they do? Well, it's tough. They're kind of in a, in a tough situation. Um, you know, if, if your bank... There are institutions that still accept American clients. It's a rather small list. It, it's not every institution in the world, but it's a shrinking amount. So you're going to have to rearrange your affairs... Uh, to work with the institutions that will still work with American clients. It's an inconvenience, yes, but uh, that's just the reality of the situation. So it's about really capital controls, is it not? Is that not really what they're, that's really what they're trying to do. It's, it, not, it's not money laundering. It's not really criminal, criminal intent. The element of tax evasion, possibly, but the vast, vast majority is just control movement of capital. Yes, keep there, it within the countries. Yes, there are two. In my opinion, there are two main uh, objectives of FATCA. One is not; it, it is not revenue collection. They are not collect. If you look at how much revenue they're collecting versus how much of the costs, how much it costs to implement FATCA, it's it's no comparison. The costs far outweigh you know any sort of meaningful revenue that they would get. So if you look at the cost benefit analysis, it clearly is not about revenue. First, I think you're right. It is about controlling capital, but that's that's not the end of the story. The other part of, of FATCA was it was is that it paved the way for what is known as GATCA. FATCA is mainly concerns American citizens. If you're not an American citizen, FATCA doesn't really affect you very much. However, FATCA, you or excuse me, you look at the uh, international bureaucracies like the OECD and the UN, and they've seen what the U.S. has done with FATCA, and they're like, hmm. You know, this is you know we can use this for other countries too. So we're going to make a global standard based on the U.S. FATCA. So what FATCA did to American citizens, you know, basically destroyed their financial privacy and you know made it much easier for the government to control and track their capital is going to happen on a global basis for everybody if the OECD and the UN get their way, and that's going to come through GATCA. FATCA's done. I mean, you know, it's 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 over. I mean, the, you, it's it's an established fact of reality that FATCA exists. GATCA is not quite there yet. GATCA will come. Is supposed to come into force into 2018. But when you look at what if when if GAT, if FATCA was not the end game here, and it only led to GATCA, you got to think. Okay, is GATCA the end game here? What are the governments going to do when they have all of this information? And some people have speculated. That uh, if you, you you know you've probably heard of this Thomas Piketty guy who's calling for a global wealth tax. These types of people have been calling for a, a, some sort of regime of global taxation for many years. It's nothing new. Whether they use some sort of excuse or another sort of excuse, the bottom line is they've always wanted a global tax. And I think with GATCA that will give them the infrastructure to actually have an enforceable global tax. So I think it's a terrible thing, of course, but I think that's kind of where the end game is going here. Nick, um, from an international perspective, what are the solutions? What does an investor do to uh, protect himself against these whole policies of financial repression and, matter of fact, protect them from FATCA? Well, if you're an American, there's nothing you can do to be protected about FATCA except... Well, you're encouraging. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's true. It's, there's nothing you can do. You can renounce your U.S. citizenship if you're concerned about FATCA. That's, that's all you can do. It's, it's, it's done. Um, in terms of protecting yourself from financial repression and arbitrary government edicts, there's a lot you can do, and you can make it. You can make yourself a very hard target. Uh, first and foremost, you want to get some of your purchasing power, your wealth, or however you denominate it, outside of the immediate reach of your home government, whether it's U the U.S., Canada, and so forth. And that makes it very hard. Not impossible, but makes you a hard target if there were some sort of wealth confiscation or capital controls or bail-in. Um, you'll look at Cyprus. Doug Casey and I went to Cyprus in the wake of their financial crisis or their banking collapse. And we met with a number of wealthy Cypriots and smart Cypriots, and they saw that their country was <laughs> into trouble, that there was going to be a financial crisis. So what did they do? They got their money out of Cyprus, and they were thus spared the effects of having their money trapped in Cyprus with the capital controls and also the confiscation that came afterwards. So it, the, the lesson there is is to take action before it's too late. So, for example, an American can easily uh, get a bank account abroad uh, in in certain places. There are, like we said with FATCA, the, the choices are limiting, but it's not impossible. It's you know you can do it. It, it depends on your individual circumstances, but I mean, if you, in many cases you can open a bank or a brokerage account from your living room uh, in a different country. 
So say you open a brokerage account in Singapore, you can do that from your living room and then you put some money into that brokerage account. Well, you just put some money offshore and outside of the immediate reach of your home government. You can also do the same thing with gold, physical gold. You can have it stored in private uh, non-bank deposit boxes. You can also do that with foreign real estate. Nobody can really confiscate your foreign real estate or your home government can't really confiscate your foreign real estate. So there are things you can do to protect yourself uh, from these kinds of measures and you know from financial repression not just the direct effects of financial repression we also have to consider the indirect uh, socio-political effects of financial repression if you look at you know how it makes savers poorer essentially what is the socio-political effects of that going to be you know there's going to be a lot of people calling for more you know you know, equality and distribute, you know, redistribution of wealth and that kind of stuff. So you want to protect yourselves not just from the direct effects of having your savings stolen from you through artificially low interest rates, but you also want to protect yourself from the inevitable socio-political consequences that come from uh, financial repression as well. We had a similar conversation a while ago with uh, Tim Price in London, and I said, you know, Tim, it really to me feels like something's going to happen and it's like being in a th theater and somebody's going to shout fire and we're all heading for the for the equi exits and Tim says no that's not the way it's going to be Gord he says he says what's happening is they're barricading the exits right now so the only way you're going to get out of that theater is you're going to have to substitute your seat from somebody with somebody who's outside the theater and what do you think the chances of that are going to be so the, you, you, if you're going to do something, you have to do it before somebody yells fire this time. That's the bottom line. Again, because of the amount of ring fencing and the amount of rules and regulations that are coming in. You know, you mentioned opening these accounts, which you, in, in some cases you can do. But I caution our listeners, your income tax form in the United States just gets thicker and thicker. The amount of filings for every foreign account that you have, uh, you're going to need an accountant. Yes, and let me uh, speak to that real quick. Yes, that's true. But you shouldn't view that as a deterrent. You definitely should comply Valid. with you should Valid. comply with the you know absolute letter and spirit of the law with this kind of stuff because the penalties are absolutely draconian. You don't want to play games with this, so you want to comply. But don't let it deter you. You should actually look at that and say, hmm, look at these these this stack of forms I got to comply. It's not it's not a stack, but you know you do have more forms to comply with. And look at the, all of the effort that the politicians are going to to try to pen you in, to try to fence you in. You shouldn't take that as, oh, gee, I shouldn't do this. You should do the opposite. You should be like, oh, I wonder why they're penning us in like this. We should, you should, you should take that as motivation to internationalize. On the contrary, you shouldn't be deterred by that. Absolutely. Last question before we, we go, Nick. What are you doing? What are you doing personally to protect yourself in this regard? Yeah, I've um, been fortunate enough to have uh, Ancestry in one of these countries that allows you to get uh, citizenship through Ancestry. I have Italian heritage, and that has allowed me to get a uh, second passport with Italy. So I've, I've you know, I've practiced what I preach. I inter I've tried to internationalize as much of my life as possible. My my savings, I have, you know, different uh, accounts in different countries, and, and, you know, my assets in different countries and so forth. And, and um I have I have done these things and uh, will continue to do these things because I you know see the same kind of risks that you do, and I think this is a good way to protect yourself. I think it's a responsible way. At minimum, it's an insurance policy about what could happen, and hopefully you never really need the insurance policy. But not to have it, and uh, when somebody else yells, yells fire, it'll be a real problem. Nick, can you tell our listeners how they could learn more about? your writings, because I know you do a fair bit of writing, and on these subjects, and how they could follow your work? Yeah, sure. The easiest way is to go to internationalman.com, and you can get our free newsletter, which has a you know just a wealth of, of really good, actionable information there as well. It's called the International Man Communique. And yeah, just explore that site, because there it, it's, it's pretty easy to navigate, but there is a wealth of information on these topics that we have uh, been discussing. Nick, an absolute pleasure. Enjoyed the conversation. You brought a lot of uh, great comments uh, to the show, and we have to have you back again. Great. Sounds good. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.